Friends, welcome to St. John's Online as we begin our journey through Holy Week, through the liturgy of the Palms and the Passion of our Lord. I'm Deacon Shane, and I'm honored to worship alongside you. You can learn more about the St. John's community, including information about our Holy Week services in the video description. Come and journey with us and consider making a donation to support our ministries. We begin today with a reading from the Liturgy of Palms, Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, the first 11 verses. When the disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now we turn to a reading from the Liturgy of the Passion, Mark's Gospel in the 15th chapter, the first 39 verses. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. And what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd, release Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. 
and they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the King of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was God's son. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard it said that the gospels are passion narratives with very long introductions. Today, we hear the central aspects of our Lord's passion from Mark's gospel. What thoughts does the word passion recall for you? It can have several meanings. It could describe in the context of love, desire, or intense emotions. For example, you could say, D. H. Lawrence's 1928 book, Lady Chatterley's Lover, described a passionate affair. It may also describe strong emotion in a non-romantic sense. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech with passion. It might also refer to deep engagement with intellectual pursuits. Albert Einstein had a passion for science. It can also be used to describe the suffering of an individual in situations such as illness, injury, persecution, martyrdom, or other hardship. And it is this later meaning of the word that is the focus when we hear the term Passion Sunday or the Passion of Christ. In this meaning, passion can be defined as the capacity 
to endure suffering for the sake of something. What or who is your passion? What are you willing to endure for the sake of it? In Greek, the word passion comes from the root pathos, which encompasses both suffering and deep emotion. It's an appropriate word to describe this central aspect of all the Gospels, the unbreakable, unwavering, and utterly transformative divine love revealed to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' passion transcends the limitations of our human capacity and understanding. If love is the passion to endure suffering for the sake of someone, then the pinnacle of that love is what we encounter in the gospel today. It is a love that knows no bounds. It triumphs over the darkest circumstance, but it does not overcome evil with violence or hatred. Love overcomes by not breaking. Jesus is passionate about love. God is passionate about love. Jesus is passionate about loving you. God is passionate about loving you. Do you and I embrace that in its fullness? As we journey through the harrowing events of Jesus's passion, we are invited to confront the cross and the depth of Jesus's unbreakable love. What came to mind when you heard the reading of Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem with the crowds crying, Hosanna? What passionate emotions were felt by the people who laid palm branches in front of Jesus that day? Do you think they imagined the sort of passion that would be exhibited at Golgotha later that week? What kind of passion do we welcome Jesus into our lives with? How can we understand what Christ's love is prepared to endure for the sake of you and I? I invite you to enter the gospel narrative with me to explore that question. This is Christ's passion. In it, Jesus demonstrates a love that endures accusations. We witness Jesus being brought before Pilate, facing false accusations. And despite the weight of these accusations, his love remains steadfast. Jesus innocently endures. We see Jesus enduring suffering. Jesus is flogged, subjected to excruciating physical pain. The soldier's brutality is unleashed upon his body, but his love persists as he willingly takes on this punishment. In this suffering, Jesus shows us that love does not fail. Love does not fail even during unimaginable agony. Jesus endures humiliation. Soldiers taunt and mock him, dressing him in a purple robe and placing a crown of thorns upon his head. Yet his love remains unwavering. He endures the humiliation. Jesus endures torture. He is led to Golgotha, where he is crucified. As the spikes pierce his hands and feet, 
Jesus embraces the agony. His love endures even the most unimaginable torture. The physical and emotional torment he experiences is beyond comprehension. Though his body breaks, his love does not. And Jesus demonstrates that he has a love which is not selfish. We witness the scene at the foot of the cross where Jesus is taunted to come down, to use his power for personal benefit, but he refuses to save himself. Jesus' love is not driven by self-interest. It transcends personal comfort. And finally, Jesus endures the depth of death. As he hangs on the cross, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words express the depth of his suffering and anguish. Yet even this, in this moment of profound darkness, he remains committed to fulfilling the plan of salvation. His cry from the cross is a testament to the depth of his love. And it is a cry that echoes in our own lives and throughout history, as we often ask amid suffering, where is God? The cross is the ultimate demonstration of God's love. I pray that it reminds us that though we may not understand our suffering, we are never alone in it. God is here. But what do you and I see from our perspectives at the foot of the cross? What passion is evoked in us? We encounter a pivotal moment at the foot of the cross in the gospel today. Imagine the scene. The sky darkens, the earth trembles, and Jesus breathes his last. In that moment of darkness and despair, the centurion, a soldier accustomed to witnessing death and destruction, is overcome by a revelation that transcends human understanding. He looks upon the crucified Jesus and declares, Surely this man was the Son of God. What stirred the heart of this Roman soldier to recognize Jesus as the Son of God? It was not through eloquent words or persuasive arguments, but through the power of Jesus' sacrificial love, a love that endured accusations, suffering, humiliation, torture, and death. So as we reflect on the centurion's revelation, let us consider what is in our hearts when we welcome Jesus with shouts of Hosanna. Are we prepared to follow him to the cross, to embrace the suffering and sacrifice that accompanies discipleship? Are we prepared to break down the barriers to receiving the love of Christ. As we enter Holy Week, may we draw near to the cross in a new way. We can begin by engaging in this week in all its depth and fullness. The Stations of the Cross on Wednesday, when we experience the 14 Stations of Christ's Passion, Monday, Thursday, when we encounter with the disciples in the upper room, the Last Supper. It is when Jesus gives us the example of how to love and serve one another. Good Friday, when we have a chance to stand at the foot of the cross in all its starkness. The Easter Vigil on Saturday evening, when out of the darkness 
a new and passionate fire will emerge. And Easter Sunday, and through the resurrection, we enter not just a day, but a season of new life. Let's pray for one another that in our journeys to the cross and beyond in the coming week, we will be filled with a new passion, a new passion for the depth of God's love revealed to us in his Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. comes to us humbly, riding a donkey and proclaiming a message of peace. Let us pray. That Christians hear and share the word of God as true disciples. That all the ends of the earth receive the words of the King of Peace. That all leaders of church and of state prefer humble service to empty power. That those who see the cross starkly revealed in their lives draw strength from the name above every other name. That we who hope to greet Jesus when he comes again be ready and joyful. God, our creator, you show us the way to freedom through the gentle obedience of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant our petitions as we seek to follow him. We pray this in his name, Christ the Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen. Passionate followers of Jesus, who are inspired by the Holy Spirit, go and serve the world that God loves. Thanks be to God.